Hello, I'm Lauren Centrella, Director of Development at WAMU. I'd like to thank you all for attending the event this, this afternoon and welcome you to the author series. We're thrilled that over a thousand people have signed up to join our Book Thief discussions today. WAMU has deep roots as a media organization in service of the community. We are truth seekers and storytellers. We strive to expand our listeners' horizons, stir their souls, and help them engage in real and meaningful ways with their local, regional, and global community. And these author series do just that. This event and others like it are possible because of your donations. Please consider making an additional donation at dianereem.org slash give. It's the donations made by you that help us produce these events. Please welcome our host, Diane Rehm. Thank you, Lauren. And to those of you who were with me for our discussion, The Book Thief, welcome back. And to those of you joining us now, I'm so glad you're here for this special conversation with Marcus Zuzak. He's the author of six novels, including I Am the Messenger, Bridge of Clay, and of course, The Book Thief. His works have sold millions and won numerous awards, including the Margaret A. Edwards Award for making a significant and lasting contribution to young adult literature. And I would add to adult literature as well. Marcus Zuzak is joining us from his home in Sydney, Australia, where it's very early in the morning. And I'm just thrilled to have him with us. If you will have questions for Marcus, type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to just as many as we can. Marcus, welcome to the Diane Rehm Book Club. Oh, thanks, Diane. There is nowhere else I would want to be. And it's uh, not that early. I think it's pretty civilized, actually. So I'm just so happy to do it. And if there was anyone I was going to get out of bed for this early to do an interview, it's you. So oh, thank aren't you, you dear. Thank you so much. I read that you were absolutely shocked by the popularity of The Book Thief. And I wonder what you feel now as so many millions of people have been drawn in. And, you know, I told you I have now read the book three times. And last night I watched the movie, which I'll ask you about a little later. But I just wonder about your feelings with this incredible outpouring of interest. Yeah, I mean, now I look back and I'm just really grateful to the book and it's almost like I'm very much outside of it and I just, I'm, I'm still, I'm not, I guess I can't, you can't stay amazed at something for 16 years, yes. uh, 17 years. You, you, at some point you've got to accept that this is what's happened and, but I, but I am still, I think it, it gets renewed each time. And even now, all these years later, to think that now I'm talking to you for a second time, it, it is, a, a, there's, there's still a sense of kind of wonder at how these things happen and that this book could have sunk without a trace the way I thought it would because it was supposed to be a 100 page novella. and. I think in those 17, you know, got a bit out of control. And, uh, but I think in those 16, 17 years, I've sort of, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I just, I, I look at it, I, I, all these 
fresh memories come up about what it could have been. Originally, see, I didn't, I'd forgotten this the first time around when I spoke to you. Uh, you know, and when it first came out in 2006. And I remember now that when I first started it, I had all these stories that my mum and dad told me, for example. And my mum, who grew up in Munich or outside of Munich, said that when she was a, a really young girl and there were American soldiers stationed in her town, uh, they had their own radio show. And at lunchtime, they had a show uh, and because they couldn't say Munich the way the Germans say Munich, they instead of saying München, they said Munchen. And so their radio show was called, at, at midday, it was called Luncheon in Munchen. And, oh, uh, <laughs> so they, and so um, I, that was my original title. Uh, you know, when I was first going to write this book about my mum's sort of childhood, uh, growing up at that time, it was going to be called Luncheon and Munchen. And I think The Book Thief is probably a better title <laughs> for a book. So uh, I think uh, all these years later, you look back and you think, gosh, there were so many possibilities, but there, there was a sense of things that were meant to be with this book. And it just, I, I just seemed to scratch something open in my mind and pull that world out. And it's sort of resulted in where it is today and that we're here talking about it today. You really thought it was going to go nowhere. You really thought you had written a book nobody was going to read. Yeah, I, well, I, I imagine somebody trying to recommend it to a friend and saying, oh, you got to read this book, you know, and the friend says, well, what's it about? And then what do you say? You say, well, it's set in Nazi Germany. It's narrated by death. Uh, nearly everybody dies, and uh, it's five hundred and eighty pages long. You'll love it, you know. <laughs> and so, so I didn't. I and and I think it shows how little I know about publishing that I I didn't really. You know, I just thought, oh, this doesn't. F and of course, you never want to get, I think when you're a writer too, and I'd written four books before The Book Thief right. and people, you know, didn't, most people don't know that. And, um, and so I had some experience within writing, which was you never expect that something, you never get your hopes up. And uh, also, you know, you never expect, you know, it's, it's like when, you do get an offer for a film to be made or something and you sort of sign it up and you go, yeah, but it's never going to get made. <laughs> They'll never make it. And so all you, you, you never, ex you, you hope for the best, but expect for nothing. And, uh, and it was, I think, heightened with this book because, you know, it meant so much to me and I, I was too close to it to understand uh, what it was doing and, and that it would strike such a chord yeah. with people and mm -hmm. it was a, a you know so shock to me at the time and and i guess less so now less so now let's talk about the beginnings of it though your mother and father were both wonderful storytellers just sort of around the dinner table i gather and told you about their own lives growing up in Germany at that time. Can you recall feeling something special that you were listening to when you heard them tell their stories? Yeah, I think there are there are two, it's funny when you, when, and this is the thing with talking to you, Diane, as well, when you ask a question that I see all these answers come up, you know, and I, it's sort of like six or seven and I go that one or that one or that one. And then I think, and then by the time I've got to the seventh one, I've forgotten what the first one was, <laughs> which is probably the best one. And, um, and so I, in this case, I, I think I'll start with the idea that I'm the youngest of four children 
And my oldest sister is seven years older than me. And then the second is six years. And then my brother is two years older than me. And the significance of that is people always say that the youngest child or the young, youngest sibling is always spoiled. And I always say I was. And the way I was spoiled was I got to spend the most amount of time with my mum and dad at a meaningful age. So I didn't get their attention as much when I was really little, but when I was 13, 14, 15, I would go on, you know, I was the only one left at home a lot of the time. And so I would say to my dad, oh, can you tell me that story again about that guy who used to, and it was often, it wasn't like, I never said, could you tell me your war stories? Could you tell me about how your dad was, you know, he, how he was a house painter and he had a lot of Jewish customers and, you know, and, and they, there was, a, so they, they called him, you know, the Yuda Mala, you know, and, you know, the painter for the, for the Jews and things like that. And, and, or that you were invited to go to this special school. You know, my dad was, he was a good athlete. He was good at school and, uh, and he had, you know, he was fair haired and had blue eyes. And so they, he was, you know, these two men in coats came to his, so I'm already off on this tangent, Diane. And, uh, and so I, and so these two men in coats came to his house and said, uh, uh, you know, and he overheard them talking to his mum and dad and uh, he could hear his mum saying, no, no, you're not taking my son. Wow. And, wow. and so, and then when, after they said no, then his father was sent uh, to the, to, to the war again after already serving in the first war. But then I would always hear these stories, uh, you know, and he was sent to do one of the worst jobs that you, you could do. And, uh, and that was because they said no to their, you know, to allow their son to be spent to this special school to make great Nazi citizens, you know? And, but those stories were always told, number one, as just childhood stories, and number two, also with this idea in mind, always that whatever hardships they went through, they were the lucky ones, you know, they were the lucky ones. And so I did grow up hearing stories of cities that were on fire. And I, I, when I look back now, I recognise that there were always these great opposites in the stories where, so my mum would say, you know, we went into the bomb shelter, which was just someone's house you know someone's right. basement right you know and then and she said and then we'd come out and the sky was on fire but the ground was covered in ice you know and and snow and so I always had these opposites of you know like the fire in the sky the snow on the ground and you know and then that seemed to fit in with the idea of uh you know, just what humans are capable of. And so there was this, this beauty, uh, there were these beautiful moments in the book set against um, the terror of what, of what was happening around them. And so I didn't understand why I was doing that. It was just a part of the language of that book. And I understood the language of the book. And what I mean, I guess, by the language is not even the words, just the way the book felt just the way the book felt. And, uh, and that was kind of what I translated as I was writing the story. So um, you described your father as this young blonde haired boy. Sounds very much like Rudy. And yeah. he is to many people, the favorite character, but you may be interested in knowing I had three scholars on the program in the last hour, and their favorite character was death. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that many times. Yeah, well, in, in all the, the, the years in between, uh, so it's amazing how how people come up to me and they say, 
you know, one of the things about reading your book that was really nice for me is they said, I, I'm not, because of your portrayal of death, uh, I'm less afraid of dying. Good. And, <laughs> Good. And I often laugh and I just say, well, I'm really happy for you <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I'm not feeling any better about dying. <laughs> <laughs> from having written the book. But, you know, I think I, I like that idea that, you know, there, it, it just it, it just grew. I didn't mean to do that. Like, I didn't mean, I just had, I, originally death was a lot more sardonic and he, he was enjoying his work too much uh, in the first version of the book that I wrote because this was one of those sort of, magical times as a writer where I had I just wrote the first 200 pages of this book in a month and I just had this routine where I lived about eight or nine kilometers so let's say five miles from the beach and I would ride my bike to the beach in the morning go for a swim and then ride home and then I would start work and I would just write very freely and I wouldn't check too much and uh and but then then I read then I read those two hundred pages <laughs> at some point and I went oh my god this is terrible this is but, but what made me think <laughs> that this was any good but what I realise now is that I or I realised even at the time was at least I had a sort of carcass which is it sounds a bit grim to to pick from and they were and you just pull all the gems out of it. But what I realised was that death was too typical a death and he was enjoying his work too much. And uh, he would say these awful things. And it wasn't till I came around, you, you do all this other work where I had Liesl herself tell the story and then I had a new problem. And the new problem was that Liesl, despite my German Aust and Austrian background, was the most Australian sounding German girl, you know, in the history of books, you know. And so I had a new problem. And, and this is really important because this is what I say to people is I don't necessarily have a great imagination. Uh, that's not, you know, people say, oh, you're a writer. You must have a great imagination. And I say, no, I actually just have a lot of problems. And your oh, imagination your imagination is getting around the problems or getting through the problems. And so the, the, the problems that I had with death and so on led me to the death I needed. And the death I needed was the one who just took that edge off. There was this power that death had, but the concern for humans and his liking of humans and that he was a little bit afraid of humans, that was the slightly unexpected thing I needed. And, and he has a sense of humor. He is not draped in cloth, carrying a scythe. He yeah. has humor and he gives us a sense of what's coming next without giving the whole story away. That was really quite an ingenious technique to have death as that character who leads us through the story. Yeah, it was, you know how it came about was I had, I was teaching at a school and I had these kids at a high school and I had these kids who were interested in writing. I love that your dog's there. My little oh, dog is here and I, she's making it's, noise. Oh, don't worry. My, actually, you might see my dog wander onto screen here at any moment too. And, uh, but I was working with these kids and I gave them a first line to a story. It was these four kids who were interested in writing and they came in at lunch and, uh, and I gave them this first line as you do as a teacher. And I said, uh, he, I said, the f and the line, I still remember the exact line. I have seen the color of time on three occasions. And I don't know if I didn't just randomly give them that line, there would possibly be no book thief. 
Uh, and I wrote with them and I wrote three short pieces about someone dying. And it was white, red, and blue. That, and I described the color of the sky. And, huh. and, and I, it was all, all the time writing The Book Thief, those were the first three colors at the start. And then at some point I went, oh, but the Nazi flag was red, white, and black. And so I changed the blue to the black. And, of course. And, and so I just had all these little gifts along the way. And, uh, and so with death, it was very, it became very interesting to me to play with the idea. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what, and that's what I tell people about writing is uh, that what you have to do is you have to do all this work where you get up in the morning and you feel doubtful and you go, oh, I can't write, I'm hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. This book's no good. And then you, you go to your desk and then you start work. And it's a little bit like climbing a mountain. Yes. But there's a sand pit or a sandbox at the top. And then you get to play. But you don't get to play without climbing the mountain first. Oh. And, and so with death as the narrator, what I started to realise, as you said, you know, where he says things like, I don't wear a robe, you know, that I really, I, I, yeah. I really, really right. like this idea of me in a robe and the sun. And he says, you know, if you really want to know what I look like or the closest thing, go and have a look in the mirror. And so I wanted death to be like the missing part of us. And it made sense to me because, you know, death is really what makes sense of life and what gives everything we do meaning. And in the case of, say, Rudy as a character, I didn't know. I had no idea that halfway through the book, death was going to say, by the way, Rudy's going to die. Uh, it was, it, it was it, an it, awful, an awful it, revelation. Yeah, and, I, and you know, I, I then looked back and I just, there was an instinct and I just went, do it now. Just do it now. And then I did it and it felt right. And when something feels right, even if it's wrong or like sometimes you use a word, you know, in that case, it's wrong, wrong to give the game up, you know, and in that way. But then what I realised was, number one, it's a slap in the face to the reader when they, there's no way they could have seen it coming at that moment. And number two, I just thought it gives power to everything Rudy does in hindsight. I didn't know at the time, but us having this idea that Rudy's going to die uh, halfway through the book, everything he does after that kind of has more gravi gravity. You're right. You're absolutely and, right. And, and I didn't mean to. There are two questions mm -hmm. that have come in from those who are with us. The first is a comment from Wendy who says, you navigate the intersection of brutality and tenderness so beautifully. Is this an intentional focus? What experience or inspiration do you draw on to be able to do that? Yeah, I, I have a very... It, it's not so much experience of, you know, in terms of real life experience that, that brought me to that. I think what it is, is just sitting down and, and doing the work and writing. And what happens is I don't, even though, and I'm a planner, like I, I write, you know, I've got my little book next to me even here now where I just write chapter headings out. And so when I was writing The Book Thief, I would write part one and then I would go write part two. Here are my eight chapter headings. And here's part three, here are my eight. Because it was always, it was 10 parts of eight chapters in each one. So what I do first is I set up a structure for me. I sort of build a house, you know, structure that I can't really step outside of because unless I can really, unless there's a really good reason. And then, I just, you know, so what happens is, so I set up the ideas and I, I do all this work 
And with and a good example again is say using death as the narrator, where he would say things like the trees who were uh, yeah, standing over at the left there or the sky. And they're alive. Who, they are alive. Yeah. And he talked about like and, and the sky who was wide and blue and magnificent. And in terms of this question too, and that I remember that line being at the moment where Max appears in the procession of people being taken to Dachau and Liesl comes in. And so again, here's the, the, the way that I do that is my mum had told me this story and this was the, the story that really led to the book. There were all these stories, but the one she told me that always made me want to write the book uh, was, was that there was this procession of people when they were kids, they always played in the town and, and they would hear like farmers and, and, you know, work people working on farms would often herd animals through the street and they'd all run down to see it. And there was one day where they ran to the main street of town and it wasn't farmers bringing animals. It was people being taken to Dachau and they were walking and they watched as there was an old man who couldn't keep up and this teenage boy and it shows that teenagers have always been underestimated you know it took but it took a teenage boy who ran inside and this old man was staggering across the road totally emaciated and he gave him a piece of bread and and then a soldier came and ripped the bread away threw it away and whipped the old man for taking the bread and then he chased the boy down and whipped him for giving him the bread. And in that moment, in that story, there's, and this is when the old man actually, he, he held the boy by the ankles and, you know, cried him to his feet saying, thank you for, for, for doing this for me. And so in that, you've got the beauty and tenderness of that moment and the, the destruction and the, you know, the, you know the and the evil intent of of the, of the soldier and what what he's doing and I thought you bring those two things together and so it's not my experience but it's a story that I heard and so I was always bringing these two things together and and so yeah that that idea of tenderness and and terror in the same breath that's what humans are capable of and, and death has a little line at the end of that scene in the book where death says you should see what happened to the soldier later yeah mm. yeah so, and it's yeah it's and and he yeah he's often doing that where you he'll there's so there are all these there are story and, and i think that's the thing that I really understood with the book thief and even, and death says it at one point too, that he says, you know, there's a story within this story. Of course. And story within that story. It's story within story within story. And so I felt all of these kind of layers in that book that were constantly being unearthed. And part of that was just bringing those opposites together. And it's something that has always excited me as a writer was, putting two opposite things next to each other. Here's another comment. The Book Thief is truly my all time favorite book. It helped me cope with the possibility of death when I had cancer surgery. Mm -hmm. That must make you feel good. Yeah, I yeah, it, it's one of the it's it's one of the things that I you know I always remember, and you never know what you're going to say in these situations or in an interview. But when I was and, and still now, but I still remember you know, and I've I've read so many interviews with various people, but I always remember for whatever for whatever reason right now an interview or a, a book about Bruce Springsteen where he says you know when you're a when you're a struggling artist coming up or you're a musician or something. You know, you're often told that you're not being useful or practical. And he said, so, you know, I want to look at my job as being useful. And, 
or something along those lines, I would hate to misquote. Uh, and so when you realize that your book has been useful to somebody like that, and, uh, and you know, or where you even dare to think of a, a book or something you've written being a comfort or inspirational to somebody and to think, you know, all you write a book and you couldn't possibly, can you imagine that when, you know, you're 14 years old or something like that and you read a book and you go, that that's the best book I've ever read. Like that, that, that is my favorite book, you know? And I remember feeling like that reading SC Hinson's books, you know, and going now that's what made me want to be a writer. And and so when someone says to me, this is my favourite book, you know, it's funny seeing your dog there and I, like I've only just started, so I just go on these tangents, I'm sorry, but it, it, it makes, it'll make sense where um, there's something, you know, to me, like I've had, this is the dog I have now, is, he's our third dog. And we had these two other dogs who were kind of, they were, there were these wild dogs that we brought in, but I loved them so much. And there's a line and just something that I've been writing recently where I, where I say something like, you know, give, uh, don't, don't bother with all the earthly treasures of diamonds and other, you know, precious things. A, a, a dying dog is precious. You know? Exactly. You, exactly. You, yeah. And, and it's, a, it, it, it's a really beautiful thing. And it's also one of the other things that's really you know, precious is that you could write a book and that then someone unexpectedly says to you, that's my favourite book. And so, I, you know, to me that this book has become some people's favourite book, like one person's, let alone more than one, and that it's given people comfort about life and death uh, is so unexpected and amazing to me. And it's, and it's the one thing that I never ever take for granted it that is so special every time someone ever says that to me and I just say I can't thank you enough because there are millions and millions of books in the world of course and for you to, for you to love course. that one and is here's so here's another one he says I've written I've read the book thief probably 10 times in English, a couple of times in German, and listen to the audiobook in German. What kind of feedback have you gotten from readers in Germany? How has the book done in Germany? Mm. Yeah, that's a, that was one of the things I was really nervous about when I went to Germany, when it came when the book came out there back in I think it was 2008 uh, which is also you know the thing that this book has like did what it's done for me was it was a sort of gateway to the world where you know I've been I got to go to so many countries from Germany to Norway and Sweden to Taiwan China Brazil you know uh, it's uh, amazing, but the place I was really nervous about going to was Germany, and mainly because of the idea of research, where someone will say, "Hey, you didn't get that right," and uh, and and that was I, got, I even I even researched, and so I should have, uh, but I even researched the the seasonal habits of apple trees in and apples in. And around Munich at that time, and I was so like, talk about a book that is meant to be that one of my cousins lived in Munich at that time. She got a job there. She was a chef, and she 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 had a little chart saying when all the apples <laughs> are ripe. And so I chose the right so that you know Bill from the South Australian or the North Carolina. Apple Growing Association can't write to me and say, hey, wrong apples. Right, <laughs> so, right, yeah. But in, in Germany, I, there's a, this allows me to sort of tell a really sort of fun story about my dad. My, there are a lot of stories about my dad throughout the writing of this book. Where a lot of the inspiration comes from my mum's stories. But, but my dad, 
when the book came out in Germ in Germany, my dad read the English version of the book Thief side by side with the German translation, at which I thought was quite an amazing effort. And he, what he said to me afterwards, he says, and you have to just forgive me for a moment, although it's not too bad, but he says to me, comes up, he says, I just have to tell you. And this is how my dad gives a compliment. He, he said, well, now I have to tell you, I've read the book in English and in German now. And he said, well, I have to tell you, it's not as if the book is shit in English. It's just so much better in German. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, Jim, that's great, Dad. Thanks. Yeah. I, I realized that Alexandra Ernst, who is the German translator, she's a great translator. You know? yes. And uh, I said, thanks. I, I re I'm going to tell her that you think she's a better writer than I am. And uh, <laughs> so, but he, um, but in Germany, you know, I was so amazed uh, that um, they, they really embraced the book. Really? And yeah, and and it's one of the places where the book thief has done, you know, better than, you know, it's probably third, fourth or fifth in in how the book has sold around the world. And uh, and I remember being in, uh, I went to five or six cities in, you know, a week, and I remember finishing in this small tavern in Leipzig, and there was just a very special sort of feeling that night reading from the book and talking about the book and uh you know all my fears were sort of allayed where and i think it's testament i guess to the idea of stories and that stories are what make us who we are stories are what we're made of that these a story could travel from germany to sydney and come back again uh in sort of different clothing Indeed. and Indeed. still have some element of truth inside it so its reception in germany was was a relief let me just put it that way tell me about liesel liesel is such a darling charming tough little girl mm -hmm. and she shows that toughness in her ability uh, to take on the boys, to play soccer even better than they do, to stand up for what she believes in, um, and to finally recognize the extent of not only her foster father's love for her but to recognize as much how much her foster mother loves her rosa mm -hmm. but how closely is liesel based on your mother mm, it's it, the the thing that i often say to people is uh often i'll say or someone says, oh, so that's your mum in that book. And I say, it is, except when you think of it this way. And what, you, what happens at the start of the book, Thief, is that Liesl's brother dies right. and train stops and he, her, Liesl's mum buries him. You know, they get, he, he gets buried in the snow next to the railway line. And, uh, and that was a story that I heard about after the war, um, about a friend of my mum and dad's and, uh, and one of her siblings. And, and so when I attributed that to Liesl, as soon as you fictionalise or you, you make something true, let's say something's based on a, a real person and you make one thing up or you change one thing, it's not them anymore. And so as soon as I did that, and it was good that it happened at the very start of the book, that uh, Liesl was Liesl, and my mum's name is Elizabeth, which oh. is shortened to Liesl, but I never saw her again as my mum. I see. And, 
even in the, the small elements that were true. And, uh, but, and, and things say with Rudy that, that are based on my dad. And, and it's often, and I think this is what happens with novels is that anything that's based in any kind of truth, it's usually just the very smallest things. It, it, and so what happens with a book like The Book Thief is it starts with, with true stories and then it leaps off into this imaginary world and then you just keep borrowing little bits and pieces of the truth. And sometimes you will stick to something where like there's one story where Hans Huberman is back, he's working in World War II, he's in a truck and this guy says to him, hey, that's my seat, you got to move. And Hans Huberman says, oh, sure, you know, and he moves seats. That was by, originally in the book when I first wrote that, he refuses to give up his seat because that was a story that I had heard and, and I just kept it. And then I went, oh, that's actually not in character for Hans. For Hans. He would never fight for it. You know, he would always just say, sure, take of the seat. Of course. And, and that's what allowed him to survive the truck accident that happens exactly. 10 minutes. Exactly. down the road so you're trying to make any of the true stories uh fit in with your novel and uh you know not necessarily the other way around you're trying to get the novel to work here is another comment um she says i read this book years ago as an adult jewish woman i felt I was very informed about World War II, but I'm embarrassed to say I had never thought about the humanity of the regular German people. The book thief gave me the gift of opening my mind and my heart to think about the people who were also the victims of warring governments, leaders. Thank you for changing my life and making me a deeper, better person. I mean, that, that's so generous. And uh, this is, yeah, I started getting a bit teary hearing that. And yeah, I wish I could go to that person who sent you that comment and just give them a hug right now, you know, uh, it, because it, it reawakens in me what it felt like to write the book. And, and it was always, it was always set in those ideas. It was never, and, and what I mean by that is that idea maybe of humanity and, and, what the opposites that we were talking about bring together uh, at the start of the interview that I honestly I have to you know to be really honest about all of that it was it was the stories and what was happening in the stories that that I was aiming to write I never you know and this is this may be I don't know I think some people every now and again are a bit shocked by this but you know the word holocaust for example was not in my mind when I wrote this book. It what I, I never had this big, I never had the big, or not even, even World War II. It, it, these were, I never had the themes in mind. I never, I just had these stories and I thought I'm gonna write those stories because they're great stories and they're beautiful stories and they're terrible stories and I'm gonna write the stories. And, and that's what, then resulted in this book that, you know, I, I set out to write a book that really meant something to me and it turned out mm. to be a book that meant everything to me. And it's wonderful. And I, I remember finishing it. I was, uh, because I'd had these other books out and I was still not really making a living off just my books and not many people can. And I never thought that I would. But I was speaking in high schools at the time and I, was, I wasn't home. I, I'd gone down to Melbourne from Sydney to speak in high schools for the next two weeks. And I flew down to Melbourne with, and I would always go down and hire a car and then stay in this real cheap motel. 
and I still had part 10 of the book thief to finish. And I knew I had to get it to my publisher by kind of early that week. And because she was going on maternity leave and uh, at the end, you know, by the end of the month. And so I, I, ne- and I got down to Melbourne and that Sunday night, I wrote the first half of part 10. Uh, I stayed up all night and then I went and did five sessions at a school that day. Then I slept. I, I still remember it so clearly. I went, it's the little things. I got back to the little motel. I went and had something to eat. I watched Frasier and then I went, I went to, I, I slept that night, did more schools Tuesday. And then Tuesday night, I stayed up and I finished the book thief. And both of those nights that I stayed up all night, I was just crying the whole time. And I remember there being tears on the, you know, just that the table was all, the little table that was just had all these sort of tears on it. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to clean. I'm not going to clean it up. I'm just going to leave it there. And then at the end of the week, when I move it, you know, when I go out there, um, at the end of my stay, then whoever comes in to fix up the room, then they can, uh, that uh, they can. And, uh, and, but it, it was just, uh, I think I realized at that point what the book meant to me. Now, and, uh, I have a question for you um, about the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you had a hand in it, um, but there, was one statement that death made in the movie that you did not make in the book. Mm -hmm. I finished the book and every single time I read it, I thought since Max and Liesl reunited in Steiner's clothing store, was it he that she married and moved then with to Australia? Mm -hmm. You never say that they became lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. The movie inserted that line to take away the idea that they married yeah and i wanted them to marry and you (laughs) left you left that option open open in the book so why did they take the liberty of inserting that line and did you agree with it Mm. that's a very very interesting question and i didn't so i didn't have really a hand in the movie you didn't Uh, not really uh yeah the only but the only thing i can take some credit for is that the girl sophie nalise who played liesel they couldn't find they couldn't they said they looked at up to a thousand people kids really girls to to play liesel but they couldn't quite find the right one and I, i saw this French Canadian movie here in Sydney. My wife and I went to see this movie called Monsieur Lazare, and there was this girl in it. And I walked out of the cinema and I said to my wife, That girl could be Liesel. And my wife says this incredible thing to me, which would never have occurred to me. She said, You should tell the movie people. And I said, Oh, I would never have thought to be so forward, you know, or to that they would want to, you know, listen to me. And and then so I did. And then she ended up being narrowed down to one of the three girls who might have played her. And then they they took her. And they the reason they took her was that they said that they could believe that she would beat up, you know, in this in the film Franz Deutscher, but in the book, it's I think it's a kid called Ludwig Schmeichel or something like that that she beats up in the playground. Yeah, you know, right. And he's teasing her, and uh, and so the idea with Max, I, again, I'm gonna I'll be really honest, and this I think comes back you know to to sort of 
the, one of the previous questions about the beauty and the the um, the destruction being so and the brutality being so close together was with Rudy, for example. Where people say he was my favorite character. How could you let him do, you know, kill him like that? I know, and, I know. And, and this is awful. But, uh, what I'm going to say, if it sounds awful, but I say it to those people, Rudy was my favorite character, you know, as well. I loved Rudy from the moment I started writing him. I say he was but not, charming. He was yeah, darling. And, <laughs> he was adorable. Well, and it's so great that you're saying that because the next sentence is but not for one second did I consider letting him live at the end of the book. Really? And people go, people go oh, that's such an awful thing to say. And I say, yeah, but we wouldn't love him the way we do if I'd let him off the hook like that at the end. Interesting. Uh, and, and in the case of Max and Liesl, I always kind of wanted, I, I was some more on the, I'm in the other camp where I, I didn't really, I, I didn't really mean, and this is the great thing about writing books is that half the time you don't know what you mean or you're trying to figure it out and people bring their own meaning the way you did with Max and Liesl. And if you want them to get married all those years later, they did, yeah. you know, I, I, I love, it's like, Go on. But the movie precluded that and yeah. said they remained friends for yeah. years. To me, that was sort of like, and you would remember, and because I know what a close reader of, of, of all books, but, but this book as well, that you are, that there's a moment where, uh, where Liesl, uh, she there's this idea that Max is kind of like a brotherly figure uh, throughout as well, and which is not to say that that couldn't change. Uh, but to me, there was, this, there was this sort of romantic idea, like people say, oh, it's so much more romantic if Max and Lisa will get married. And I say, but there's also another romance, which is that if, if Rudy couldn't have Lisa, then no one from that world kind of could oh. of the book oh. and that maybe Max and Lisa will remain a uh, sort of brotherly, a sisterly relationship their whole lives. But I say to people, you know what? I always imagine when I see, when I finish a book or the credits of a movie come up, I always take the characters off into my new world for them you know, where I envision life for them beyond the, the pages or the screen. And so if anyone wants Max and Liesl to live their lives out together, that's <laughs> absolutely what they did. You know, we're hearing about all these alternate universes all the time. Here's another question for you. Are you considering applying the moral clarity and courage your main characters have in the book thief to any of our challenging issues today in a new book. Your voice is powerful and in my opinion, desperately needed now more than ever, especially for our teenage students and readers. Yeah, I. I would, there's a, there, a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, but every now and again, someone comes to me and says, oh, I've got a story for you, or hey, uh, you, you could write this story. And it's, there's a, there's a kind of weird or strange magic that gets a, a book over the line. And I think you have to get a book over several different lines. And the first one is to begin it. And for me, it, it's often the first, I, I know I can write a book about whatever the topic is or whatever the subject is, whatever the story is, when I get the first line right. And, the first, and when I heard the line in my head first, the colours, then the humans. That's how I usually see things. Uh, I, that was when I knew that I could write the book thief. And so 
when it comes to so first you 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 see an image in your head of something that could happen i usually see the beginning the end and i get the title of the book very very early in the process and so <sighs> this book was apart from when it was going to be called luncheon and munchen but that was years and years before i was even close to beginning so i guess it's sort of like Maybe the other analogy is that it is kind of like an iceberg coming out of the ocean, becoming slightly more and more visible. And then you go, now I can write it. The problem for me with writing about issues of today or what's happening today is I'm a slow thinker. I'm not, I, I, if I was to write about things that are happening today, it would probably be 20 or 30 years <laughs> down the track. That's how long it takes me to get to the point where I can start writing. Well, and on that point, because we're almost out of time, I do want to ask you about why it took you 16 years to write another book mm. after the book thief. What happened in you? Were you drained? Were you just needed that length of time to refresh rebuild what mm. yeah it was a combination of many things and the first point is that the book thief became it, the book thief was came it was just a it came across as a complete shock to me that it was not the book that I, I thought it was going to be. And what I mean by that is I had this idea for a book when I was 20 years old called Bridge of Clay about a boy who was going to build a bridge and his name was Clay and the bridge was made of him. And to me, this was always, I had this ending in mind and it was always going to be my best book. It was my best idea, I thought. And that was the book that I was always thinking, one day I'll be good enough to write that book. But it was always problematic. And even I wrote one version of that book not long bef before my first book was published, which was called The Underdog. And I, and I went, I wrote it and I went, that's not it. And, and this is part of, I think part of the, one of the biggest things of being a writer for me is I write something and I go, that's not it. And then I try again and I go, well, that's not it either. And that's not it. And that's not it. And that happened with The Book Thief. And then when I got The Voice of Death right, I went, oh, that's it. That's and it. then all that other work that you've done, you frame it into that. And But with Bridge of Clay, it was the fact that it was always a prob going to be a problematic book. I had always, even before I was published, I put pressure on myself about that book being my best book. Then I'd written this book that was such an... Uh, an unexpected success and then I was going to as I said you know I was going to Brazil and I was going uh, my and that year was the best year ever my our first I've got a 16 year old daughter and a 12 year old son now and my daughter was born three months after I spoke to you and wow. and and so everything happened that year and the book just went on this magic carpet ride that has even led to this afternoon you know and, and this morning here for me talking to you and so but it's still not to say you know I've got friends who are you know very successful writers and they write a book a year damn it I know I know, <laughs> and, I know. and I can't stand them <laughs> you know, these people are my friend. Some of them are my friends. Oh, like, Marcus. I can't, well, I'm like, don't even tell me that you finished a new book. You have done so beautifully. And I am so happy to have had this second opportunity to talk with you about this gorgeous book. I congratulate you and wish you all the best in what comes next. Uh, Diane, can I just say, it, it's an, it's an, an, I know everyone says this who talks to you, but, and, and everyone is, is right when they say it, but it's an honour, you know, getting a chance to talk to you and listen to you and be a part of everything you've created. So 
thank you for having me. And uh, the pleasure is definitely all mine. And I would do it at any time of the day. So oh, good. All... Good, thank good. Thank you. We'll talk again. We'll talk again. I hope so. Marcus Zuzak, thank you so, so much. No, thanks, Diane. And thanks to all of you. The next meeting of the Diane Rain Book Club will be on Wednesday, July 27th. We'll discuss Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens, the film adaptation of this best-selling novel hits theaters July 15th. Before you go, please take a minute to fill out a short survey about this event. It's going to pop up on your screen. Our book club is produced by Allison Brody. Kennedy Wright is our engineer. Yanling Zhang is our events manager. We couldn't do it without the support of Verendra Silva, Julia Slattery, who sadly is leaving us this week, Lynn Kronberger, James Coates, Dave Tate, Jerry Washington, and Michelle Morgan. A special thanks to you and to all these people. I'll see you next month. I'm Diane Rain.